my headphones out. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. There's no delaying. Yeah. yeah. Hear what I'm saying. Yeah. Abramson 28. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not playing. Roll call. For president. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. My name is Fonte. Yeah. And I'm showing love. Yeah. To Stacey Abrams. Yeah. yeah. First black woman go. Roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Freestyle. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Quest Love Supreme. Yeah. And we're the freshest. Yeah. yeah. I'm Sugar Steve. Yeah. yeah. And I approve this message. Roll call. Ah, <laughs> Suprema, su, 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 Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. It's Laia. Yeah. yeah. With Stacy A. Yeah. And we all about to listen. Yeah. To what she got to say. Roll call. Hey, Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. My name is Stacy. Yeah. yeah. I tried to win. Yeah. yeah! It didn't happen the first time. Yeah! yeah. So I'm doing it again. Ah! Roll call. Bars! Bars! Su, su, Suprema roll call. What? Suprema, su, su, I need an air horn. Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. Yo, you had a better guest verse than some musicians that well, we have on here. Well, thank you very much. Like, straight yeah, up and down. That yeah. was, yeah, that was that was definitely top five Bars. action in, yes. in, in the six year history. Everyone's like, oh, oh my name, I don't know where they is. <laughs> oh, yes, I am Michael Jackson. Okay, so. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are being given hmm. the honor <laughs> of having a sit down um, with the human being that I credit for literally holding our democracy in place. And I you know, I'm trying not to be uh, hyperbolic or to add extra pressure, but you know, I'm speaking facts right now. Mm-hmm. And much like my uh, beloved state of Pennsylvania, uh, Georgia is going to be a fight to the finish. And you know, for the 2% of you that have your you know, head in the sand, November 8th is a crucial date. Uh, for not only Georgia, but for this country and for history. Um, I I feel like it's our due diligence to offer our platform. And yes, like normally this is a, a, a platform for uh, musicians and artists of the like or whatever, but I think it's our due diligence to give our guests today uh, the platform um, because I often feel like uh, people who listen to us, often like people who are creatives, um, they're sometimes, you know, very indifferent or I hear like, well, you know, I'm beginning the political stuff or whatever, or they just simply feel like, uh, maybe the, the trickle down effect won't affect them that much than it already has. Um, and I can't stress to you fine folk enough that, yeah, I know there's, uh, fatigue and, you know, but we have to fight this good fight and, um, you know. I'd, I'd rather us be fatigued than to be lying on our backs and then wondering what happened months after the fact. Uh, and I believe in our guest today because um, she is about that action. And, you know, it's like the Wild West out here, and <laughs> it's time to get serious. And I want... The dirty South. Yeah, I want you people to take time out to really uh, get yourselves familiar. First of all, I believe in her affirmation that, yeah, she is going to win, but I believe that... President. I'm talking to the future president right now. Not to put hey. pressure on you. But um that'll fix Georgia first. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's work on this job. Yes. Yeah. One one step at a time. So our guest today, running for governor, and I just found out, uh, will successfully be the first African American uh governor yeah. ever. We're still dealing with firsts. Female, yeah. <laughs> yes. First female uh black governor. In the United States, and future POTUS. It's crazy. <laughs> Let's have it, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Stacey Abrams to Quest Love Supreme. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Ma, we made it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it's weird because you know I I know that you know living a life in which you're trying to uh, 
correct history and right wrongs and whatnot. And, you know, I often feel as though, like, introductions like that do nothing but add more pressure to the person than it already is. But I, just in general, I, I want to know for you, um, not how exhausting is it, but just on the everyday of, of knowing that pretty much most of us are looking at you specifically to, you know, at least hold this country in place as the adhesive that we want it to be. Because if it doesn't happen, then a lot is going to change. But, I mean, just for you in general, like, I'll offer you the platform to answer this question. Like, why... Like why did you why do you feel that you're qualified to to be the person to save us? <laughs> <laughs> so there is an urgency that I feel every day, in part because of what I know about what the world can be and what I know about what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up with uh, five brothers and sisters. My parents were working poor, but they took us out to volunteer because my my dad's succinct way of saying it was. Having nothing is not an excuse for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But what that grounded in me and what my mother, who would say, you know, no matter how little we have, there's someone with less, your job is to serve that person, is that it's not just about material. It is about, it's about advocacy. It's about efficacy. It's about access. Mm -hmm. And when you've seen people who should have had but were denied, if there is any degree of empathy in you, you feel compelled to do something. Well, for me, it's a systemic issue. I grew up in Mississippi. I came of age in Georgia. I've lived in Texas. I went to the North, but it was cold, so I came back. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're in the North. So I was born in Wisconsin. I, Ooh, I barely remember that. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. I remember cheese curds and cold. <laughs> okay. And then I went to law school in Connecticut, so I went to Yale. And in both ah. places, there are challenges everywhere. But in the South, we've been gaslighted into believing these are permanent issues. And I know it's not so. I know that the South not only has something to say, but we can demonstrate a capacity that we have been fooled into believing isn't our right. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's gotten people to listen sometimes, I'm really good at asking people to do things. I'm pretty good at organizing stuff. My responsibility is to keep pushing until I can't push any further. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate the plaudits. I see myself more as an avatar for all the other people who are trying to do this work but don't get mm. the access I've gotten. I'm louder than a lot of people, mm -hmm. and I'm more relentless than many because you know, I don't know how not to do this. I don't know how you sit still when you see the issues before us, and I know that democracy is how, I mean, you use the right word, it's the adhesive, but it's also the toolkit. Right. And so for me, this part has to be done, and if not me, then you know who? Okay, so I'm one of those people who's definitely guilty of, you know, I'll I'll watch Mad Al on NBC, or MSNBC or something, shake my head like somebody got to do something. Like if anything, <laughs> I think in the last three years I was the king of, man, I wish somebody would da 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 da, mm -hmm. and then I find that I'm the person that's called to do that. For you, what was the pivotal moment? Like back when you were at Yale. And I'm the or Spellman, right? The Spellman before that, it's yeah. Fun. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, back when you were in college, where, you know, what were your lofty goals mm -hmm. in life? Like, are you imagining that some 15, 16 years later that you'll be in the position that you are now, or were you just like, okay, I'm gonna be a lawyer, or da 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 da? Or I had like 27 majors in college. I was <laughs> physics and philosophy with a minor in theater. Oh, wow. Turns out I liked Star Trek, but not differential cal uh, calculus. Okay. And when you can't stay awake in epistemology, it's probably not the thing to do when there are only four <laughs> people in the classroom. Uh, I like acting, but not enough to make it my life's work. And so I, I flitted through a bunch of other things. But what was the through line for me was activism. So one of the, the pivotal moment for me when I realized that it wasn't just an inherited property from my parents, it was part of my DNA – when the Rodney King decision came down in 1992, I was a freshman at Spelman. I organized students to protest. They locked down our campus. I was at the AUC, and if you if you know Atlanta, they locked down I-20, so mm -hmm. you could not get off of the interstate and come to our to the university center. So Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, Atlanta, Morris Brown, 
ITC and Morehouse School of Medicine. And then they tear gassed us. They tear gassed the entire area. Wow. And this was under a black mayor. <laughs> oh, no. And, and this is Spelman and Morehouse, Spelman too, and Morehouse. so that's even deeper. Like, wow. But the, the schools were juxtaposed uh, next to some of the oldest housing developments in the that's nation. Right, universal. Yeah. And so the issue was they we weren't you know elite students and poor communities. We were all black. And we were all basically accused of the same anger. And the problem was the protests were real because the pain was real. Mm -hmm. And so I helped organize students. I actually got into an argument with then Mayor Maynard Jackson. He won the argument, but because he couldn't <laughs> out argue. And I was like my cleanest t-shirt and my nicest jeans, but he still won. Uh -huh. But he later hired me to work in the newly created Office of Youth Services. Okay, let me ask something. Um, because you know I, I did not go to college. Like I immediately got a record deal and had a career. But often, you know, even in seeing movies or whatever, I got friends. Well, the roots would always play colleges, but I always wanted to know what is the effectiveness of the college protest? Because even, like, if I would have went to college, like, a lot of my friends would, like, be part of protest about, like, back when uh, divesting funds in South Africa South or whatever. Africa, yeah. But, like, what's – when – we protest on a college campus. Like, what's the goal? Especially when, like, the issue is 3,000 miles away in Los Angeles. Like, how does that trickle to? So two things. One, what Rodney King's, what the verdict was evocative of was the lack of justice from police. Mm -hmm. And that was happening in Atlanta. That was happening in Georgia. And part of it was where poverty exists, where racism exists, you are going to find police misconduct. And there was also the larger issue of, simply the evidence of our eyes being denied those things well rodney king was <laughs> emblematic of it he was but he was only one example he was the first example that got caught on tape right. but people had those experiences everywhere and that's why it was so in inflammatory the protests i organized we started this moment we watched we marched from the auc all the way to city hall so to your point i i didn't go to a college where protesting at the college made a lot of sense because we all pretty much agreed the most effective protests leave the safe spaces and go into the public spaces. So we made sure that march went past the housing projects, went past the liquor stores, all the way down to City Hall. That's how I ended up getting into the tete-a-tete -tete with uh, the mayor. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but to your point, there are some campuses where protest on campus is it's effective because if you're at Harvard, you're talking about billions of dollars in economic influence. If you're an AUC, the, the <laughs> numeric... The monetary effect is smaller, right. but the salutary effect is bigger because you have people who may have been conditioned to think that they were the exceptions to the rule mm -hmm. who have to remind themselves that they are part of the same fabric, that people don't ask you, they don't investigate, did you go to Spelman? Why are you in the AUC? Why are you in Southwest Atlanta? They just see someone who looks like something they've been taught to be afraid of or taught to, to disregard. And this is true for a lot of different communities of color. Mm -hmm. It's true based on your economic situation. And where protest comes in is protest moves beyond the space that you inhabit, and it tells the rest of the world you've got to pay attention. It's a bullhorn. Exactly. I understand. So do you consider that moment your first footprint in political action? It, it was. My parents will tell you because my mom and dad were in grad school here in, uh, at, in Georgia, they hadn't moved back to Mississippi yet, and I gave out my phone number mm -hmm. to tell people you know, during the protest. I'm like, if you if you want to join us, I wow. didn't think through the fact that I was giving my parents' home number out. Oh, oh yeah. no cell numbers. Yeah, yeah. You do the yeah. Mike Jones. No, and <laughs> and they they pointed that out to me later on as the phone started to ring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it was it was it was both in a moment of empowerment, but a, a moment of ownership that I. I want it to be a voice for people who didn't know they deserved to be in that march, that didn't know that they deserved to have better, and who'd been lulled into thinking that because you had leadership that looked like you, that they shared all of the same issues that you shared. And that's just never true. That, that notion of monolithic power is just not real. Mm -hmm. And so even within spaces, I mean, Maynard Jackson is an extraordinary mayor, but in this issue, when it came to youth poverty, he had not done what I thought needed to be done. So my job was to push that. And so for me, it was it was a moment of reckoning. Like, did I actually believe the things I was saying when I was safely on campus? And turns out, yes, I did, so. Mm -hmm. At the time, were you like uh, 
student body president or like I don't know what the the president yeah. system is for college now. Like, <laughs> I used to be president in my ninth grade class, but I mean, like for you. So I wasn't then. I eventually did. I was at that point. I was just an annoying soft. I mean, freshman in college. You, I was freshman, and you were a freshman. I, I was my freshman year. So how did you? Like, isn't it hard for freshmen to get the respect and the... I, w- I was relentless. And weren't people, like, <laughs> afraid of being suspended or kicked off campus or... Yes. So one thing that happened, part of... I, I kind of short t- shortcutted the story, but it was a few phases. When they were tear gassing the campus, this is before social media, this is before cell phones, and this is when you only had the television stations, the, the base, the broadcast stations. So I organized students in my dorm to call all the broadcast stations. They were lying, saying that we were you know, running amok. I'm like, no, we are angry and protesting both on the campus and out in the community, but this isn't a riot. And they were miscommunicating what was happening. So I had a bunch of friends call all the stations and flood the stations. And the stations got wise to us and said, well, who's calling? And so I said, just tell them you're me. So you had like 75 <laughs> Stacey Abrams is calling. And that, love it. that amplified my voice. Again, didn't think through the consequences <laughs> when they sent the police to come and get me to take me to this event. They, I wasn't being arrested, but I was invited to the simulcast because all of the, sta- the television stations in Atlanta came together because this was a crisis. Mm-hmm. And so the mayor was there, and I was invited as one of the students to be there. And so that sort of – that lifted my platform a bit more than I expected. I'm curious, did you – what your full experience was in college? Was it – all work and no play and activism or because I also know you went to Spelman at a time and full disclosure I went to Clark and I think it was I'm right behind you but at a pivotal time in Atlanta period mm-hmm. like Olymp- post Olympics maybe so the, I was right before the Olympics right yeah. before okay so mm-hmm. right before the Olympics so can you talk about like what kind of student you were in that way? Like, did you have fun, a social life, yeah. did you have I was a nerd, and I'm I'm an introvert, so. I heard this. That's why I was yeah. surprised that freshman year you went all out and started the Well, program. I was, that was after. She could be on Left Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bunch of nerds and introverts. Yeah. Yeah. She mentioned Star Trek, so that was the. I, it, well, Supreme. Next Generation was out, so. I, next yes. Generation. <laughs> yes. Picard, you're a Picard girl. Picard, Janeway. Look, I, I, I do the whole universe. Yes. Wait, so, <laughs> wait, time out. Picard is everything. Like I, you Mr. know, Mr. Data, Jean Luc, yes, Jean Luc. <laughs> Who is Jean Luc? Every day I find out something new about <laughs> this person I've known for thirty plus years. But go ahead, even though she's still nineteen. That's right. Go ahead. So I, this is probably the best example. When I became student body president, part of your job is to make sure that there are social, like, social active activities. I got two of my best friends. I created a position called the social activity coordinator, so okay. I wouldn't have to go to parties. So it. you wouldn't have to go. Yeah. To so I, they would set up the parties. They would. I would come at the beginning to say hi, and I would come at the end to make sure nobody stole anything. Otherwise, I was back in my dorm. Oh, so you were that girl that everybody was trying to get to go out, and you were like, yes. I have meaningful things to do. I never went on spring break. What? Well, wow. it, why would you pay she money to go roots. sit in somebody else's hotel? I mean, like I was, I had a Woo-hoo. dorm. <laughs> I could read Don't anywhere. Don't be making sense up in here. <laughs> I like. <laughs> okay, so you said something, and I think. You know, I, t- I try to pull as much personal inspiration information from our guests that come on this show, but I'll ask you. Yes, sir. Because I feel like the one small task that is that I'm holding myself back from actually crossing the line to where you are, despite the fact that I'm hosting my own podcast and do other things, I have an extreme fear of public speaking. And to me, I feel like when you're in political action, it's always like you have to be on standby for gotcha journalism or whatever. Like, I don't know if you've ever crossed the line and went over to the other oh, propaganda yeah. news corporation I, or whatever. <laughs> or like, or yeah. just the fact that, you know, oh, yeah. people, we now live in this place, Stacey Abrams, no, 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 no. You know, what do you think about the dolphins in the sea? Whatever. <laughs> right. But... How do you get over the fear of speaking? Because I've seen you speak before. And, you know, for an introvert, you, you project well. Amazing. I guess it's the acting help. But First time I did public speaking, on, so, you know, I grew up in the church, so we had to do, you know, Easter programs, Emancipation Proclamation programs. Never liked any of it. I'm not afraid of speaking. Oh, you speaking. had to read the... Uh, Oh, we had to like do like sister, sister Bertha's having a cookout, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, a sick and all of the stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. You name right. it, we did it. My fear isn't public speaking. I, I'm reticent about being around lots of people. So, 
when I was in high school, I joined the debate team. I had a psychosomatic case of laryngitis. Wow. What? Because it occurred to me that I couldn't be, de- I wouldn't be debating by myself. That other people would see me do it, and suddenly my voice didn't work. And went to see the nurse, and she's like, "There's nothing wrong with you." I'm glad <laughs> like, you said psychosomatic. Yeah, it was, and that's when I also learned what psychosomatic, you know, right? Like a psych- what psychomania looked like. Artists often do that, and that's often an issue on the show, like yeah. when people self sabotage their progress mm-hmm. or whatever. Well, I had to get over it because I was going to fail the class if I didn't actually, you know, had to have to speak. And so the way I get past it is that it's not about me. It's about what they need to hear. It's about what people need to know. I can get past the, you you can't sublimate it, but you can work around it. And I think you do that. You do that, Mm -hmm. you find yourself in public spaces speaking, you give yourself a script, you give yourself an objective. And for me, the objective is change. It's getting people the things they need. And if my discomfort gets them to what they need, then I'm willing to do it. It is never fun. I have never, I don't enjoy it, but I'm good at it. And the consequences of inaction to me are worse than the consequences of action. And so for me, the, the cost benefit analysis is, you know, Stacy, stop yeah. having a laryngitis and go ahead and do your job. So, okay, speaking of inaction, and let's cut to the chase here. Um, <laughs> November 8th is coming up. Yes. And, you know, I know uh, specifically. Uh, my demographic, my specific demographic, which is black men, black men. Um, I was like fifty year olds. I'm just and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nineteen. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm very shocked at the statistics that we. I mean, I'm not. Sh- I'm shocked, and I'm not shocked um, because I know that we're the, the first to complain about something, and really the last to, you know, to really want to do do the groundwork if you will. So, you know, I'm finding out that black men vote the least or probably feel the least uh, represented. Probably, yeah, or represented or, you know, and I I know I got many uncles and cousins and friends that ain't nothing going to happen and yeah. they ain't run for us or they the feds or they the ops <laughs> or whatever. So for you, um, what you're facing in Georgia um, and that will subsequently affect because you know if Kemp does remain in power, then I know that laws are going to be implemented. How does that? I'm happen? already pissed about this whole like we can't give water to people or yeah. aid to people. So just in general, like use this platform to explain to us what is at stake. So you said, how does that happen, <laughs> and what's at stake? We have a governor who ran his first campaign on rounding people up and pointing weapons at people and saying that he was a politically incorrect conservative, he was a Trump conservative. And then people, because he didn't commit treason once in 2020, he he didn't commit treason by, he did what every other governor in American history has done and he certified the election, he's been Uh given praise and lionized. But 2018 he did that to you? (sighs) See, and that's part of the challenge, the memory is short. And we are we are, your last good. Yeah. <laughs> and so he gets credit. Now what people aren't aren't paying attention to, and this goes to the issue with so black men have let's be clear, they vote, mm-hmm. but it's the vote share. So vote share is the proportion you have in the population versus the proportion you have in turnout. Okay. Black women have the highest vote share. We vote our numbers. Mm-hmm. The next group is white women, the group after that is white men, then black men. So the issue is not that black men don't vote, it's that their power in their vote, so they fight below their weight class. Yeah, And so the goal that I have is not to say that black men, no one, and no one should, suggest that black men don't vote. It's that they don't, they they fight below their weight class, and if black men fought their full power, it changes things. But there are legitimate reasons it doesn't happen, especially in Georgia. Georgia had, at one point, the fourth highest incarceration rate in the nation, and it was predominantly black men. And Georgia, like Florida, nearly permanently Mm disenfranchises black men. And those who aren't permanently disenfranchised are you know, flooded with so much misinformation, they mm-hmm. don't know they have the right to vote. Wow. Then you have communities that when you have generational poverty, generational stereotypes, and generational disinvestment, no government doesn't work. You've seen people who look like you get elected and do nothing. But the reason that often is true is that we tend to elect, in Georgia and in the South, we elect black people at the local level. And we, you know, we finally started to make some progress at the federal level. But state government is the intervener that stops many good things from happening. Governors matter. 
Especially uh, now, right? Like a yeah. st- Stand Actually, Your Ground was signed by a governor. That's why Trayvon Martin's killer went unavenged. The treatment of black women as parasites through the social safety net, that happened under a governor in Wisconsin. Mass incarceration did not start with the 94 crime bill. It started with Three Strikes Are Out, which was signed by Governor Pete Wilson in California. Oh. Jim Crow never had a single federal law. It was all state governors in nine southern states. And so we, we legitimately, especially black men, legitimately protest the lack of delivery, but we don't understand that the delivery system is the state, not the local government. In the state of Georgia, the governor decides how much money gets spent. The mm. governor sets the budget. The governor signs the laws. In the city of Atlanta in 2003, I helped write the first living wage law for the state of Georgia. The mayor of Atlanta signed that law. By the following January, that law was illegal in the entire state. They made it illegal for mm. a local government to pass a law for living wages. On-call scheduling hurts a lot of black men who want to be a part of their family. It hurts a lot of people. But you're on on-call scheduling. You want to be able to plan your day. You have to say, what is that? The Secretary of State, the person who currently is Secretary of State, uh-huh. as a state legislator, passed the law that says that no one can, no local government can require that on-call scheduling actually respect the humanity of a person working. The governor, Brian Kemp, in the midst of COVID, passed a law saying that you couldn't sue your employer for not protecting you from COVID. Didn't do a thing to demand that you get access to PPE, mm-hmm. but he did make it possible, impossible for you to file a lawsuit against the, when he reopened the state, when they forced you back to work, they could make you come to work, but they didn't have to protect you when you got there. Mm-hmm. That's this governor. So that's why I'm confused then, Stacey. Because most people don't understand. They All they know is that, well, he reopened the state. Yeah, 38,000 people are dead. Right. Yeah. We were, I was literally having this conversation with, because I, I was like, I want to have a conversation with some young folks that actually live here, and I was talking to two of the young folks behind the camera and we were talking about Georgia is a little it's different in the sense and they're from what well, Chicago and Detroit respectively and now they're residents but speaking to a I spoke to Rico Wade yesterday and I said I don't understand why the polls say that things are close when y'all was here y'all saw not even I mean COVID that's nice but we saw with the injustice that happened to Stacy in 2018 and he said to me he said yeah but politicians always cheat and I was like, well, yeah, but that was, we, the whole world watched it. And, he, and it was just a matter of fact, like Georgia kind of, I felt like, okay, you know what? This is this is some Georgia, excuse my language, shit in a way, some South shit where things go a little differently in the Northeast. You mean in terms be, of moving the goalposts? Yeah, like oh, it couldn't man. be so blatant. Oh, yeah. And we would never have let a man like that only be governor again and re- go again, think he has a chance again. Well, not, so the law he passed that is voter suppression 2.0. Yeah. This law not only says you can't have water or food, it give, he's, out, he's outsourced voter, voter purging. 64,000 people have had their voter registrations challenged because he and Brad Rapsenberger put in place a law that says that you can – any person can walk right. into a county board of elections and say, I don't think that Amir has the right to vote. What? And right. you have to prove yeah. that, you have right. that you have the right to vote. They don't have to have any evidence. And it used to be that if it looks fishy, the, the Board of Elections could say, this is, a, this is crazy, we're not going to do this. They now have to process every single challenge. And in Gwinnett County alone, 37,000 voter registrations were challenged. I heard about Gwinnett County. I heard yeah. it's a problem, right? It's, no, but this has happened across the state. Okay. But this is the same state where, because of Brian Kemp's law, SB202, four different boards of elections, the people who control where the polling is, if you get your, if your name's there, they kicked all of the black people off of the board, and it is legal in Georgia for them to do so. Brian Kemp did that. But the reality is, and this goes just to the larger issue, not only of black men, but of the urgency of this election. If this is what they're willing to do now, imagine when he is a lame duck governor who mm-hmm. can't run for office again. When he has, f- he has six, nothing to lose. He has nothing to lose. He's this got $6 I know, billion. Yeah. Dollars. He already took our bodies away from us and the right to... He's Make got decisions. $6 billion at his disposal. Yeah. We have a surplus. Once you pay every bill, we've got $6 billion sitting there. He has told us his intention is to give this money to the wealthy. And so yeah, part of the too. goal of, of today, and I appreciate this conversation, is that most people are so legitimately consumed with their lives and with their fears and with their realities that politics feels like an, an extra burden. 
I like to say politics, you may not be into politics, but politics is into you and it is a stalker. And mm -hmm. we have to understand that stalking <laughs> usually turns into <laughs> something grave and terrible uh -huh. that you will one day see on Lifetime movies. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to push back and my, my job my interest, my intensity, is because I know what the consequences are if we don't do it, but I also know what the possibilities are if we do. We can invest in people, we can restore bodily autonomy, we can make certain that black men and black people writ large, but black men in particular get re-enfranchised and actually have an active role to play in their futures instead of a governor who thinks that restoring mass incarceration is an okay thing to do. Okay, so for cats like me on the sideline, that we want to do something. Now, last year, you know, I raised money, went out on the streets. I mean, d d even handing out what? Like, I, I would go to polling places and all those things. What can we do uh, and, and non celebrity help? civilians? Because we all want to well, help. Well, when Georgia. I mean we, I just meant yeah. like flesh all and blood us. people. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> what can we do uh, to help alleviate the situation that I know is going to be problematic? So, number one, feel free to give me money. Uh, and, but here's Word why. Up. No, but here's why. Take all my money. I am running the so our campaign has the single largest voter engagement apparatus in the state. That means going into the places that most people don't go to get to the voters most people ignore. That's what that's what we do. But it takes money because I actually pay every canvasser twenty dollars an hour. We don't. We pay a living wage to oh, our canvassers. What? Yes, I was doing that for free in a college town. But but right? when you yeah. got to go to a small place, when you have got to go to Colquitt County or go up to Dade County, oh. or you're in Clayton County and you have got to knock on all these doors mm -hmm. in these apartment buildings, this is a job, yeah. and yeah. people need to take. So we need volunteers. But before we get volunteers, I need people who I know can show up to work every single day. So mm. your investment is in that work. Number two, I need volunteers. I need folks to reach out to their communities. But I also need people to talk about this on social media. Okay. The other side is spending a lot of time pretending this doesn't matter. Every negative narrative you hear, they amplify it. They will tell the lie a thousand times until it sounds like the truth. We tell the truth one time and we shut up when no one says amen. I need us to talk about what is at stake okay. and who is, who these people are, who my opponent is, and who I am. And we may not agree on everything, but if you look at the totality of my work, I show my work. Yeah, And so think about if you've got to guess who's going to do a better job, the guy who's told you he doesn't care about you or the woman <laughs> who's shown, shown you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I need folks to be talking about this. In 18, there was a national conversation. This time it's been a more, bit more muted because we've been dealing with so many things. I was going to say, yeah, how do you think the pandemic we, uh, it, and COVID, how do you think that is The pandemic, COVID, priorities? inflation, racial violence, mm -hmm. people are tired. And, mm -hmm. and you, you, you laid it out very well, Amir. People are exhausted, but pain doesn't care about your exhaustion. Politics doesn't care about your exhaustion. Our responsibility is to show up anyway because the consequences are going to visit us whether we invite them or not. Okay, so let me ask you this. As your sister, and it's funny, I, I do another podcast with, with two sisters, Jill Scott and, and Asia from Kendra Family Soul, and we're always talking about self-care. <laughs> I need to know, Stacey Abrams, what is your self-care ritual? Do you do have something daily? What do you do for self so that you can go out and give all this energy to all <laughs> these people? Because it costs. I, I watch an inordinate amount of television and I read Star books. Trek. <laughs> That's fine. Let's rest. Star what, Trek. What are you watching? What's your show right now? When I say I watch a lot of TV, it is a bit absurd. Um, right now I'm good. watching Eureka. It feel good. Because really? I, I didn't watch Eureka when it came out before. I okay. love it. So I'm on season five. And very I've, heard, I've heard about it. It's really good. Uh, I'm waiting for Equalizer to come back because I love Queen Latifah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I watch all of the FBI's. I think there are 27 of them now. Damn. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, once you on Law and Order, you got to decide. Well, yeah, well, no, I'm on Law and Order. You on Law and Order? Yeah. The new well, season, uh, Organized well, Crime. Well, yes. Yeah, so I know they did all three of them on the 22nd, but yes, I haven't I missed it. I haven't had a chance to watch Plus, it yet. But yes. Do you watch the first Law and Order? Because I watched. Hey, it. I was a dead body on that. <laughs> I mean, no, you was on SV, SV, SVU. Oh, SVU. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. SVU is the tight. Yeah. I watch all of the Law. I've, I've watched Law and Order. You. When I say I watch TV, I am <laughs> There's not a UK? joking. There is a Law and Order UK. Yes. What? And is the Sting have an accent? Yeah. No. You you know what? I'm putting it out there. If you organize an Outcast reunion, <laughs> they will come. <laughs> well, I think I'm talking to the person who can make it happen. No, he's hey. talking to you. I'm <laughs> talking to us. Uh, 
You know what? Some someone should get outcast to get <laughs> together. So we can, uh, yeah, yeah. Some, someone should get outcast together. Because you know it's weird. Old boy actually lives five minutes away from me. Uh, old I'm, boy. I'm just saying. <laughs> that don't have boy in his name. Yeah, the, the one that doesn't have boy in his name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he goes he yeah. goes fishing in Long Island like four days a week. So yeah, I'll I'll call him. But what are you listening to, Stacy? I'm curious. My my. So I have a 16-year-old niece who now lives with me. Okay. Oh, no. oh you get oh, put boy. on. All right. What you? No. So I don't want to tell you what I listen to because everything I say out loud, she cringes at. So, yeah. <laughs> he, most of our musical tastes are frozen from when we were basically between the ages of 10 and 25. Okay. <laughs> I, have, I have expanded my universe since then, but when it comes back to just the core narrative. So, I'm curious. I'm have yeah, you I'm had, curious. So who, yeah, yeah, who's, who are your who, people? Who do I listen to right mm-hmm. now? Uh, I just had to do some uh, – I just did a photo shoot, which that sounds so – bougie but anyway so they they play music because it's it's awkward well it's awkward to do this stuff and so they play music to relax you so it was tribe called quest yeah uh Mm -hmm. it was whitney um there was new edition yeah of course uh i also love van halen okay yeah i can see temple pilots okay there was some fiona apple yes I, i i listened to a Broad range. There was, and I'm not just p- pandering. There was some roots. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we. It was the last time you had time to go to a show. Fun at a concert. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, last night I was at Alicia Keys concert for 14 seconds, so she could Ooh. say hi. And that was a good live y'all did too. <laughs> thank you. That, that yeah. was it. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So to, um, one two step. Anything by Missy Elliott. You just get me hyped yes. up. And I have a deep and abiding commitment to all of the fun songs done by Ludacris. <laughs> I'm your person. <laughs> yeah. I got Listen. you. Listen. He, from right. the Chris Lover Lover days. Look, listen. So, number one spot, move the person out of the way. Move the um, person, yes. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting the tap on the shoulder that we, we have to wrap up. Um, this is a fun one because it feels like this is a ten minute episode of Quest Life Supreme, even though I know that we. It was longer than Michelle Obama. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> it, was, it was longer than her. Can you come back after you win? I can. That would Thank be you. so cool. Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate it, and uh, you know. You're you're an inspiration, for for a lot of us on the sideline yeah. that like, eh, hey, someone should do something. And can I give people one more thing to do? Mm-hmm. Yes, please. I need people to vote early, starting October seventeenth. We're so, allowed to vote early. So Georgia has three weeks of early voting, and the reason I need people to vote as early as they can, early voting, because we know suppression is on its way. Mm-hmm. We know they're making it hard to get absentee ballots. They're making it hard to know your polling places. They've changed the rules that if you go to the wrong polling place and you're in line for four hours and you get to the end and it's the wrong polling place, they will not accept your ballot. What? So, yes, it's called a provisional ballot. So the, the, way to, the way to overcome voter suppression is not to let it win by staying home. It is to, by overwhelming the polls with our presence. Okay. But we need to show up early. We get there the first week. We, get all of the, we know all the problems. We can get as many things out of the way, and so we're really just dealing with the biggest issues but with fewer and fewer people as we get close to Election Day. Show up early. If we show out on uh, the week of October 17th, there's no stopping us. There you go. It's hey. happening. We're getting him it's out, the big Stacey. payback. <laughs> I don't I'm, even I'm, live I'm here. Ta- I'm taking a cue from Unfinished Business in uh, EPMD. Yes, uh, yes. yes, Unfinished Business. This is the big payback for uh, our guest today. Long overdue. Stacey Come Abrams, thank you very much thank for joining us. Governor Stacey Abrams. Yes. Future POTUS. Too on heavy, be, Amir. Too heavy. On behalf of no, uh, you know, I believe in affirmation and and putting it out there. On behalf of Sugar Steve, like yeah, uh, yo, uh, unpaid bill. You missed another classic. Woo-wee. And Fontigolo, this is Questlove, and thank you again, Stacey Abrams, for, for joining us. Me. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.